Though nobody knew it immediately, the end of the world began in late 2064, when a swarm of chariot-line peacekeeping robots controlled by the Hearts Timor Energy Combine suffered a glitch and stopped responding to all commands. The chariot line was created by Faro Automated Solutions to be the ultimate answer in fully automated private military machines. They are heavily armed, and not just with guns and missiles. Their cyber warfare suites allow them to easily and instantly seize control of drones and other weapon systems directed against them. Their encryption protocols were so advanced it would take decades to brute force the command codes, and nothing even resembling a backdoor was included by the programmers. They were near impossible to subvert. They were also equipped with biomass conversion capability. They could instantly convert biological matter in their vicinity into biofuel to refuel themselves. The machines could release a cloud of nanites called a nanohaze that would strip organic matter and return it to the machine. Thus, there was no need to worry about a machine running out of energy in the field. Last, but certainly not least, the swarm was capable of self-replication. The smaller machines could repair themselves and others, while the largest could fabricate entire combat-capable units to grow the swarm and replace those lost. I ask you to think a moment about what it means, then, for a massive, combat-capable, self-replicating, biomass-devouring swarm of machines to get out of control. The Hearts Timor swarm quickly grew uncontainable. Unable to breach the security his own engineers had put in place to reassert control, Farrow Automated Solutions CEO Ted Farrow desperately brought in Dr. Elizabeth Sobeck. A prodigy from a young age, Dr. Sobeck was an engineering genius that had been critical to Farrow's early success developing green robots to clean up the environment and for civilian use. She had resigned in protest when the company shifted toward military applications. Now, Ted Farrow begged her to help come up with the solution. What she concluded, after being provided with all the data, was dire. The Faro Plague, as it came to be called, was impossible to stop. It would multiply and consume biomass until the global biosphere collapsed within just 15 months. It would not just be the end of humanity, it would be the end of all life on Earth. Dr. Sobek realized she could not save the world, and developed a solution with a different objective to ensure the rebuilding of life after the Pharaoh Swarm had stripped the Earth's biosphere. She would construct the foundations of a self-building terraforming system to rejuvenate the planet. She called it Project Zero Dawn, rebuilding the world from zero. After securing the support of Pharaoh and the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff, Elizabeth was given all the resources she asked for, and the work began. Her hand-picked candidates for the project were recruited, and some kidnapped, to be briefed about the reality of the situation. This included alphas, project leads for the subordinate functions of the system, as well as beta and gamma personnel. They were presented with a choice. They could join the project, choose euthanasia, or live the rest of their brief lives in comfortable confinement to preserve the secrecy of the ongoing apocalypse. Some lost hope upon hearing that the world would end, simply couldn't believe that Project Zero Dawn could work, and chose to end their lives. Others leapt at the chance for varying reasons. Some believed it could truly work. Others were impressed by the ambition of the project and wanted to see it through. One in particular had been a developer on the chariot line machines and was desperate for a chance at redemption. The secrecy of the project's true purpose needed to be maintained to prevent mass despair, and for the sake of an accompanying operation executed by General Aaron Jerez, chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff. 
Operation Enduring Victory was the largest military operation and propaganda campaign in human history. Every able man and woman was mobilized to resist the Pharaoh Swarm. Information about the scope of the disaster and its inevitability was suppressed. Messages from soldiers to their families were edited. Everyone was fed the narrative that enduring victory needed to hold back the Pharaoh Plague just long enough for Project Zero Dawn to be completed. Zero Dawn's nature was secret, but Jerez encouraged the belief that it was a superweapon of some kind that would save the day if only they had enough time. The heavily automated US military was a detriment, as its machines could be easily subverted by the swarm. Instead, they had to quickly regress back to manned weapon systems. By throwing as many hastily trained and equipped soldiers as possible into the path of the Pharaoh Swarm, General Jerez aimed to give Dr. Sobek and her Alpha Project leads as much time as possible. It would be, as General Jerez later described it, the greatest mass slaughter in human history. Dr. Sobek realized quickly that she didn't actually need to finish the entire terraforming system in the time they had left. What was important was to preserve the needed materials to reseed life, perfect the system's governing intelligence, and give it the ability to finish building itself. That governing intelligence would be an AI named Gaia. It would have to be the most sophisticated and powerful artificial intelligence ever created, and Dr. Sobek believed it was necessary to teach it to genuinely care about life, not simply do its job. Gaia's functionality would be divided among subordinate functions specialized to carry out tasks critical to the terraforming process. Minerva would fulfill Gaia's first task of calculating the shutdown codes for the Pharaoh Swarm, even if it takes decades, and construct transmission towers to use them. Thus, the Pharaoh Plague would be defeated, if far too late for humanity. Hephaestus would be Gaia's module for designing and constructing servitors that would carry out terraforming tasks and build any required facilities not completed by humans. Aether and Poseidon would use those machines to detoxify the atmosphere and oceans respectively. This task completed, Demeter would start to reintroduce flora to the world from cryogenically preserved seed stock. Then Artemis would reintroduce animals, starting with microorganisms and working up to pioneer organisms, including boars and turkeys. The revived human population would be responsible for reintroducing larger species, after taking control of Zero Dawn. To revive the human race, the Eleuthia subfunction would use cradle facilities that would store cryogenically preserved human zygotes. When the time came to reintroduce the human race, they would be gestated in artificial wombs and raised by caretaking servitors. When they were old enough, they would be introduced to the Apollo subfunction. Apollo would be the collected knowledge, art, and history of the human race, preserved for posterity. Equipped with this knowledge, the new humans would rebuild civilization and retake control of the Zero Dawn system, completing the terraforming process. Lastly, one subfunction existed in case something went wrong. If Gaia's attempts to restart the biosphere failed or became unsustainable, Hades would step in to wipe the stake clean so the system could try again. The creators of the system would never know of its ultimate success or failure. When their work was completed, the developers of Project Zero Dawn that didn't choose euthanasia would be sterilized and sealed in a bunker called Elysium, equipped for comfortable survival for no more than 100 years. Despite the odds, despite the atmosphere becoming toxic to humans, despite the destruction of the last military forces in January 2066, they did it. The facilities that needed to be constructed were created. Flora and fauna had been preserved. The cradle facilities were stocked and shielded to prevent detection by the Pharaoh Swarm. Rather, they had almost succeeded. Gaia itself was not quite complete, and so, after other personnel had been evacuated to Elysium, 
Dr. Sobek and the other Alphas were sealed in the Gaia Prime facility to continue their work. This is where things started to go wrong. Gaia was ultimately completed, but as the project was sealed, one of the hatches malfunctioned. If any of the facility's signals got out, it could portray Gaia's location to the Pharaoh Plague. If the Gaia Prime facility was destroyed, all their work would be for nothing, and life would be doomed. So before the other Alphas even fully understood what was going on, Elizabeth Sobek suited up and closed the hatch from the outside. She saved the project and doomed herself. After saying farewell to the Alphas, Dr. Sobek decided to go home. She walked all the way to what remained of the ranch she grew up on outside Carson City, Nevada, and died when her environmental suit failed. Elizabeth's death would have repercussions. Ted Farrow had remained involved in the Zero Dawn project from the beginning, as he footed the bill for the Enterprise. He had become more and more erratic over time, demanding constant updates from his private bunker. Dr. Sobek knew how to handle him, but it got worse after her death. Ted Farrow became convinced that human knowledge was a poison, that burdening this new generation of humans with our history and knowledge would stain them and perhaps doom them. Acting in his mind to protect those innocent men and women, or perhaps simply to prevent posterity from knowing of his culpability in the end of the world, Pharaoh locked the Alphas out of Gaia's systems and called them together for a meeting. Pharaoh announced that he had purged the entire Apollo database and destroyed all backups. He sealed the Alphas in the conference room and removed the air, suffocating all of them. The Alphas had done their work well and the terraforming process went as planned. Gaia decrypted and transmitted the shutdown codes for the Pharaoh machines. The atmosphere and the seas were purified. Microorganisms, flora, and fauna were reintroduced. When the time came for the new generation of humans to be introduced, less than three centuries after the end of the world, however, there was no Apollo to give them knowledge of the old world. Instead, the cradle facilities were forced to release the young humans out into the world to fend for themselves when their food supplies ran out. Lacking all but the most basic knowledge, the new humans would spread across the world, forming primitive civilizations, none understanding the truth of Zero Dawn and what came before. As a consequence, the reintroduction of large fauna intended to be performed with the assistance of educated humans never took place. The terraforming process remained incomplete. Nonetheless, Gaia continued to operate, managing the environment without direct contact with the primitive human societies for centuries. Then it all changed. At 0845 on August 26, 3020, Gaia received a signal that corrupted its subordinate functions and caused it to lose control. Each of them became an independent, self-aware intelligence. The new intelligences fled, removing their processes from Gaia's central core to unknown locations. Most alarmingly, Hades attempted to seize control of the Zero Dawn system to execute its function of destroying all life. To prevent this, Gaia commenced an overload of Gaia Prime's reactor that destroyed the facility. The explosion was so massive that it could be seen for many miles, and was treated as an omen by the tribes that saw it. This prevented the immediate danger, but without central direction it would only be a matter of time before the subordinate functions mismanaged the terraforming system, and the environment started to collapse. Gaia's final gambit in the microseconds before its destruction was to initiate a protocol that Dr. Sobek had ultimately rejected. The Lightkeeper Protocol had been a plan where the Alphas of Zero Dawn would raise and train clones of themselves to continue their work after their deaths, continually perfecting the system and assisting Gaia. The protocol was abandoned as unworkable, 
and frankly, the Alphas largely found the idea of raising their own clones incredibly unsettling. It had gotten far enough along for genetic samples to be put in storage before being abandoned. Those samples were put to use now. Shortly before the destruction of Gaia Prime, Gaia sent a command to one of the Cradle facilities to begin the gestation of an exact genetic replica of its creator, Elizabeth Sobek, to be carried out of the facility and given to the care of the primitive society outside its doors. The child's biometrics would allow it to access Zero Dawn facilities and view a message from Gaia describing what happened. Thus, they might begin to rebuild the terraforming system and prevent catastrophe. That child would be raised as an outcast among the Nora, named Aloy. The most immediate consequence of Gaia's destruction noticed by the peoples of the world was a phenomenon called the derangement of the machines. Under Gaia's oversight, the machines had been docile and mostly fled when attacked. Now they had become more aggressive and more heavily armed. New combat-focused machines were created, like the Thunderjaw, with new, deadlier variants emerging from the Cauldron facilities every year. Hephaestus, the subordinate function responsible for designing and producing the machines, viewed humanity as a threat due to their practice of hunting machines for useful parts. Owing to their lack of understanding of the vital purpose the machines served, Hephaestus deemed them a threat to the biosphere and resolved to stop them now, without Gaia's restraint. More disturbingly, it has begun to develop hunter-killer machines for the express purpose of eliminating humans. That may only be the tip of the iceberg, as Hades would attempt to reactivate the Pharaoh Plague in an effort to execute its function, only to be stopped by Aloy. Yet it still exists out there, somewhere. Who knows what catastrophe awaits around the corner, as the Zero Dawn system slowly spirals out of control, and whoever sent that signal to destroy Gaia must still have plans of their own. Well, that bit of world building was what made me fall in love with Horizon Zero Dawn. It's really well executed. Now, humans in less than half a century being able to build a global terraforming system in a year might strain credulity, but they only had to build the foundations, really. That was smart of the writers to make it build itself. Now, computer systems that still have power after a thousand years, and in some cases exposure to the elements, is more than I can believe, but I'll accept it. It's probably best that they didn't go too deep into the science, but they did focus on the human response to finding out the world was ending. Some gave up, some latched onto whatever hope they could, and the game presents it in a way that makes us follow along with them as they discover and react to what is happening. That, more than anything else, really drew me in. It was a compellingly revealed mystery as the game progressed. I'm really looking forward to the sequel and learning more about the Horizon world. I have some other lore videos about the tribes of the first game if you'd like, or some Dragon Age and Cyberpunk videos. In any case, I hope you all have a great day.